welcome to the 2012 Global Game Jam. I'm Gordon Bellamy, Executive Director of the International Game Developers Association. We are so proud to be hosting this, the world's largest game creation event. Uh, today I'm in London at SI Games, one of the greatest studios in the whole wide world, and this is going to be great. We have a record number of nations, over 45, and a record number of participants. We're hoping 10,000 women and men are creating games with you this weekend. This next 48 hours are about innovation, they're about collaboration, and most importantly, they're about fun. So we hope you all have a great time. We're all looking forward to sharing and to playing the board games, the computer games, and everything in between, and, and everything beyond that you make this weekend. So without further ado, let's get to it and enjoy the fantastic keynotes from around the globe. Thanks again. Welcome to the Global Game Jam 2012. I'm Brenda Garno Brathwaite. And I'm John Romero. And we are with Loot Drop. Yeah. John and I worked on three games together. Uh, most recently released was Ravenwood Fair, and that was nominated for a couple of awards. Um, my game, Cloud Force Expedition, uh, Brenda worked on that as well. And we're currently working on my game, which I can't tell you anything about. It's pretty cool, though. It's awesome. And it'll be out this some, year. Yeah, yeah sometime, sometime this year. year. So sad. Um, <laughs> so, the very first thing you need to do when you're collaborating is know your constraints. You have only one weekend, which is even crazier than our six month schedules, and you have a relatively small team who may or may not have ever made a game before. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to get too ambitious with your design. Uh, that's something that happens very frequently in game colleges on the final project and it's even worse if you try and do that during this, uh, this short weekend. So keep it to a sane amount of design. In global game jams I've participated in, I have regularly seen, when you talk about Know Your Coders, I've seen people create enough design for a team of four coders to do in two months, let alone one person in one week. So you're absolutely right about that. It's also important um, if you're using some kind of engine that already has a bunch of built-in capability that really influences what you're going to design because you might not have to code that stuff or design it. So um, if you're using a, a framework or some sort of engine, uh, that totally influences what kind of design you would do. So before you start anything, do a survey of the team, know what your skills are, know what you can do, and I'll borrow this from an old friend of mine, uh, make your design and immediately, after you're sure it's everything you need, just cut it, uh, cut two thirds out almost immediately. And then maybe you'll finish on time. And if you don't believe us, believe John Steinbeck. He went, I'm going to quote John Steinbeck. There are no good collaborations, whether in music, in art, in poetry, in mathematics, in philosophy, in games. Once the miracle of creation has taken place, the group can build and extend upon it, but the group never invents anything. That preciousness lies in the lonely mind of a man, or a woman, as the case may be, but Steinbeck wasn't being politically correct at the time. Anyway, and I also added the part about games. The thing is, is that having one person who makes the call will help things get done so much better. Now, when we talk about one person being the lead, that doesn't mean you need to assign one person to be a tyrant. That person needs to be open to feedback and needs to be great at receiving it. And it's really important that the lead knows how to cut down on features or how to redesign features so they can be implemented even faster. So I'll give you an actual example from John's game. He was working um, on Cloud Forest and there was one particular feature that I just didn't understand. It, it didn't, I understood how it was supposed to work design-wise, but it just didn't work for me as a player. It turns out he didn't necessarily get my point. He didn't feel the same way when he played the game, but he understood that it was important to me and also important to a couple other people. So. Rather than just go, I don't get it, I don't see it, it doesn't matter to me, he knew that he wanted to please as many players as possible. And so he actually did a bit of redesign based on feedback from other people. And whoever your lead is, they need to be able to make sure they receive feedback the same way. Yeah. So one of the points I've seen happen a lot in collaboration is that people will endlessly discuss the most minute details for a whole weekend sometimes. The best thing you can do is just put that feature in the game as fast as possible, and the game will basically tell you whether it's good or not. Yeah, when, games never lie. 
<laughs> uh, another important thing to know is that a game is only as strong as the weakest team member, and uh, a lot of student projects at game colleges end up with the project lead doing all of the debugging and coding for all the other team members that are sleeping around behind them on the floor. You don't want that to happen this weekend. I mean, at least wait till you get in the industry for that sort of stuff. Um, the, uh, I've seen people do that all the time. Uh, so one of the things you need to do is make sure you're pulling your weight. Make sure you know the, the weight that you can pull. Sometimes people will say they can do all these things as they head into a game jam or into a high pressure situation, uh, and they can't actually do that, or they're not as good as they thought they were. So understand the weight you can lift, and be sure to pull your own weight all weekend. Uh, remember that when this weekend is done, there are going to be people who can't wait to work together again. And there's going to be people who are never going to work together again. Consider this your first interview on your way into the game industry. Because some people around you are going to find your way into the industry. And your resume may cross a desk. And you want them to either say, yes, I totally want to work with this guy. Or, ooh, I never want to work with her. And, you know, I should have, read, I should have flipped the genders there. I, uh, one last thing that's important is that really there's nothing worth fighting over for this weekend. So the phrase that it's just a game, you know, it is just a game. And even when we're making games and there's millions of dollars on the line, I wouldn't say it's just a game, it's a game. And I've never seen a team that hated each other make an excellent game. So whatever your disagreements are, remember that you're there to have fun, you're there to make something fun, and you're here to have a great weekend, and you're obviously going to need to sleep probably for two days when this is done. So enjoy it while it lasts and have fun. Yeah, respect your lead. They can make the decisions when something is, is being argued upon. So John and I, when we are, other than a few bruises, other when we're... <laughs> so John and I have, sure, we've had arguments while we're making games, but they're usually... How long do they even last? I don't even know if we've actually, we've actually had an argument. Okay, it was a lie. Um, have we ever actually had an argument while making games? I don't think game? so. Yeah, I don't think we actually have. So the point is, is if you have, I guess, what we must do is if I have a disagreement with John's designer, I'm having a problem with something that he's designing, and the same goes his way, is uh, we'll just talk it out. And, you know, here's something you might want to consider. Ultimately, I respect John as a designer. He respects me as a designer. So when we're giving each other feedback, um, it's not coming from a place of, what are you talking about? But coming from a place of respect. Have fun. I already said have fun. You can have fun from both of us. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Good luck. Hola, me llamo Gonzalo Frasca y es un honor enorme para mí estar con ustedes hoy, gente de todo el mundo en tan buena compañía haciendo juegos. Realmente no se me ocurre una cosa, una idea mejor que Global Game Jam. Y, y bueno, les cuento que yo soy de Uruguay. Eh, Uruguay acá el mundo, eh, en las Américas y acá está Uruguay. Eh, es un país chiquitito, pequeñito, pero donde se están haciendo cada vez más juegos. Mi estudio cumple ahora este año 10 años de hacer juegos y, y bueno, y hay muchos otros estudios, más gente indies, todo el mundo haciendo juegos. Uruguay además es uno de los pocos países que ha implementado en un 100% en One Laptop Per Child Project. Entonces, eh, todos los niños de las escuelas aquí tienen un laptop una XO, y hay gente desarrollando juegos para ellos, y los niños juegan, bueno, aprenden, se conectan a internet, es una cosa realmente muy, 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 muy buena. Y bueno, quería contarles algunas cosas que, que he aprendido en estos años, uh, no sé, para tratar de, de bueno, darles ánimos para hacer el, el mejor juego que puedan hoy, y, y en realidad es una cosa simple, les voy a contar una historia, Uruguay, como les decía, es un país muy pequeño, 3 millones y medio de personas, y... Hace un, en el último mundial de fútbol, aquí el fútbol es una cosa muy, muy, muy importante. Uh, realmente, bueno, fuimos el, el, el equipo sorpresa, llegamos al cuarto puesto en la Copa del Mundo y dejando atrás a países mucho más grandes, muchísima más población. Nosotros teníamos 11 jugadores que, bueno, que pudieron jugar mucho mejor que, que equipos mucho, 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 mucho más grandes. Y, y bueno, lo que sucedió es que nadie esperaba esto, ni siquiera en Uruguay. En aquel momento, durante el mundial, yo estaba con mi estudio... Uh, trabajando en un proyecto para un estudio en Hollywood entonces hablamos por teléfono todos los años, con, todas las semanas con, con Los Ángeles y, y bueno, una vez nos llaman y este, nos dicen ¡Eh Gonzalo! 
Uh, ha pasado una cosa increíble, ¿qué pasa? No, vimos, están hablando de Uruguay en la tele y no queremos ofenderte, pero nunca hemos escuchado hablar de Uruguay en la tele y no nos ofendemos porque sabemos que es verdad. Y, y no, están jugando al fútbol y están ganando. Sí, sí, estamos ganando, aquí estamos todos muy contentos. Y, y, y bueno, cada semana seguía Uruguay ganando y la gente con la que estábamos haciendo el juego, los clientes en, en Los Ángeles, cada vez estaban más contentos y nosotros les enseñamos cómo cantar las canciones, este, oh, Uruguay, la celeste, y... Y bueno, realmente Uruguay siguió ganando, siguió ganando y siguió ganando y cada vez nos felicitaban más y cada vez era más la excitación tanto aquí en Uruguay como se podrán imaginar, como estos clientes que nunca habían este, escuchado hablar de Uruguay y que no eran realmente fanáticos del fútbol. Hasta que bueno, al final perdimos un match, quedamos número 4 y aquí igual fue una fiesta gigantesca, estábamos todos súper súper contentos. Y, y nuestros clientes nos llaman y dicen, bueno Gonzalo, realmente lo sentimos mucho este, no haber podido ganar la Copa del Mundo, la próxima vez será. Y yo traté de explicarles que bueno que no importaba, que estábamos igual muy contentos porque hacía décadas, décadas que, que nadie ganaba nada aquí y que realmente estábamos muy orgullosos de nuestro equipo. Y el cliente no me entendía, decía, bueno, está bien, bueno, pero este, la próxima vez será. Y era muy difícil tratar de explicarle por una diferencia cultural que no haber ganado igual era una cosa de fiesta. Pero bueno... Al final no tuve más remedio que decirle, sí, es una tragedia, estamos todos muy deprimidos, esperamos no matarnos, pero bueno, este, la próxima vez seremos mejores. Y el cliente quedó contento con eso. Y nada, simplemente esa pequeña historia para contarles que, nuevamente, no importa cuán grande uno sea, no importa este, cuál es su pasado, lo que, lo que haya hecho, este, las expectativas, este, no importa, pero realmente lo más importante no es... Realmente ganar. Cuando uno trata de ganar un videojuego y cuando lo gana, hay una pequeña depresión luego, ¿no? Como que ya uno no sabe muy bien qué hacer. Lo importante es hacer level up. Y en videojuegos, en hacer videojuegos, pasa exactamente lo mismo. Ganar es importante, pero más importante es hacer level up. Aquí en Uruguay estamos tan contentos por haber llegado al cuarto puesto porque nos hemos superado a nosotros mismos. Y hoy en el Global Game Jam creo que es la oportunidad perfecta. Hoy y en todos los juegos que vayan a hacer en el futuro. O sea... Quizás no revolucionen ni la industria, ni el mundo indie, ni el universo, ni el arte, pero sí tratar de ganarse uno mismo. Así que bueno, eso es simplemente lo que quería decir. Ganar es importante, pero hacer level up es mucho más importante. Así que vayan y hagan level up, aprendan, el próximo juego va a ser mejor, y el siguiente mejor, y el siguiente mejor. Nos vemos.今回はイノベーティブっていうテーマなので、一つ例えばキャンバスだったら、で、例えばプログラムだとどうしてもプログラムだけやってるとやっぱこうグーってこう
僕自身がこう実践していることでいうと例えば以前こうなんか絵を描いてる時にもうなんか自分の好きな色を選べるのにもう飽きてしまってで絵の具をたまたま描いた時にもうこう目をつぶってこうガーって絵の具を選んでそしたら全部緑色やったりとかそれ,それでも全部買うんですねそれで自分の今までこうやりたかったイメージとかアイディアっていうのはできないんですけど全然違うアイディアがそこに生まれてきて何かこう新しい価値を見出したりとかできることとかもあるのでやっぱそういうことは面白いかなと思いますうん例えばヘデンだったら結構こう自分がずっと使ってるこう8ビットのファミコンのバグの画面をモチーフにしたグラフィックっていうのがあって、まあ、それは特に本当にこにカセットを入れてガシャガシャってやってノイズを出してその形が何かに見えてくるそこからストーリーを発想させて何か新しいものを作っていくっていう考え方なんでなんかそういう,こうランダムとか思ってもないことっていうのを取り入れるっていうのはしかもとても即効性があってこう短い時間で何かを作らないとダメっていう時に実は結構役に立つ方法かなっていうふうに思ってます例えば自画像を描く時に、えっと、自分の顔のラインから描いていくのがこう風景から描いていくと自分の形がこうぼんやりぼんやり見えてくるのかでやっぱりプロセスは違うんですけど、まあ、最終的に自画像を描けるわけでやっぱちょっとそういう発想の転換っていうのはとてもこう逆の方向から見てみるっていうのはやっぱすごい面白いしインスピレーションがあると思うのでぜひ試してみてほしいなというふうに思ってますで物を作るっていうのはやっぱりこういつも僕はラブレターに例えてるんですけどまあ一人の人に一つの住所を知っててそのラブレターを送れば絶対にこうリアクションを返ってくるんですけどそれをこう10万人100万人にこうダイレクトメールみたいに送りつけたらやっぱなかなかリアクションっていうのは返ってこないと思うんですねだから実際パーソナルなことを実際ことをこうなんか大きく広げて1人のためにものを作るっていう感覚っていうのは全員が知ってるものなんで全員のために作らないで何か身近な人とか大切な人のためにものを作ってそれが全員のためになるっていうふうなものを作り方をしてくれたら嬉しいなって思ってます。Hi, I'm Paul Wright, CEO of the Stupid Fun Club, here to introduce the Global Game Jam. Now, when I think about designing games,、uh, everybody has a different process. And basically, identifying and using your process is going to be one of the most important things you do here. There's so many different ways you can go about designing a game. I'll just kind of run you through the way I typically do it. My thought process is around that. So, typically, when I design a game, I'm actually inspired by books I've read.、Uh, A lot of people get inspired by different things, but for me, it's typically that. And so, you know, other games that I've done have been inspired by various books that I've really kind of enjoyed. You know, sometimes they're books kind of around a particular subject,、um, and it kind of draws me into the subject. I get interested, get pulled into it. And I figure out how can I take this subject and make it something that、uh, somebody else will appreciate and find fascinating the same way I do. Now, there are a lot of great books out there, you know, about the game design process.、Uh, and I think that these are really good kind of for the craftsmanship. Of game design, but I wouldn't take inspiration from these. I mean, a lot of people will start a game and say, I'm going to do a first person shooter or an RTS. I never start with genre, I always start kind of with topic. And so I'll just be reading random books, and at some point I'll come across, you know, maybe one or two books that feel like, oh, I see some idea there. You know, there's something in here that, you know, I really want to kind of pursue. And then I'll basically start zeroing in, circling in on that idea. And in my mind, that's when I start formulating kind of the game design directions I want to take. Which kind of brings us to the next step, which is then taking that idea and starting to prototype it. Prototyping can have many different goals. One of the first goals, usually, when I approach prototyping, is figuring out how we're going to make the mechanisms of the game work. You know, this is very much kind of an engineering exploration, looking at the bits and pieces that are going to make our game. How are we going to engineer them? Are they buildable?、Uh, and at what cost? And that will help us establish things like the team size and scope of the game. Other kinds of prototyping can involve more direct interaction. What you're really trying to do is build some system that you can sit and play with and get a sense of how it feels kinesthetically,、uh, how it feels psychologically or motivationally.、Uh, this is something that in a game jam situation, you're going to be doing this over a matter of minutes and hours, not over days and weeks. But basically, you want to get something as playable as early as possible so you can really start touching it and getting a sense you know, what do you like, 
What do you not like? What's working? What's not working? Uh, because really games are all about interaction. And so the sooner you can get this thing interactive where you can actually start manipulating it, the better. So as a designer, what you're actually doing is you're exploring this very large design space. Uh, you're starting with this very nebulous idea, and then you're looking at all the different branches that the design could take, and as efficiently as possible, kind of pruning those branches. So for instance, imagine your design is a tree, with basically your starting point, your subject material, and the rough idea is the base of that tree. So starting at the base of that tree, you're starting to go down your prototyping path. You're going to face very fundamental decisions about, you know, is this game real time? Is it multiplayer? Uh, is it persistent? These very fundamental decisions will send you down various branches. Every time you take a turn on a branch, you're in effect basically uh, fil filtering out and erasing, you know, all the branches on that part of the tree. So when you take one path, you're basically cutting off, you know, all these different directions your game could have gone. At the end, you can end up at one of these leaves. At the beginning of the process, you don't know which leaf you're going to end up on. Uh, but you do have a sense of what direction you want to go to at every junction. So as you go down these, basically you're using prototyping, intuition, playtesting, and a number of other techniques to figure out what branch am I going to take down this path. And in doing so, over time, at every branch, if you make the right decisions, you are eventually going to end up at one particular spot on the tree. This will be the game that you're going to put into a box. Now typically, alongside of this design process where we're building prototypes, testing things, there's an equally important process that's going on, which is how do we convey this idea to people in the most efficient means possible? You know, a lot of times we'll basically do sort of sketches, uh, visual representations of the idea, uh, metaphors we can wrap around. Um, this game is like something you know, except it does that. Uh, these will get more developed over time as we find more and more effective ways to convey this idea to somebody basically from a distance. You know, basically if somebody were looking across the room at a box on a shelf, what would attract them to go pick up that box? Uh, maybe turn it around and start looking at the back of it. As we refine this message, and a lot of times this is just done by talking to your friends and describing the game and finding what parts they kind of latch onto, they need a handle to kind of grab onto to start to understand and get interested and motivated, you know, wanting to experience this. Uh, then we'll actually start refining that message deeper and deeper. And you know, in a lot of cases, I'll actually design kind of a, uh, a fake box. Um, you know, early in the design stages, and I'll have things on the back of the box, uh, sales points, bullet points, etc. But basically, it's a process of me understanding conceptually how to convey this idea to somebody who has no idea they want to play this thing, no matter what it is or how odd. Uh, that's almost as important as the game itself, because if it doesn't sound fun to them, if they're not in playing it in their imagination, they're not having fun, they're never going to give the real game a chance. And so I'd say that that kind of conceptual representation of your game, why it's fun, why somebody wants to try it out, uh, is equally important to you actually you know, crafting a great game. So I want to wish everybody good luck. Uh, you know, think outside the box. Um, but also as a designer, you know, try to understand the way you're thinking through this entire design process as you, as you design your games. And really try to make something that you enjoy, that you're actually having fun with. And uh, again, best wishes.